All right, guys, out here in the garage, section 2.1. <laughs> okay, we're back. I, you may have heard in the background. Someone freaked out a little bit. Oh, so sad. So sad. What are you doing? No, she's up to no good. All right. 2.1, the German Protestant Reformation. What does that word Reformation mean? What do all these things mean below words and everything? This is like a huge section. Probably one of the top five sections of the whole year. 2.1, make sure that you understand and know it. Uh, so there's the menu structure of the church, the medieval church and the issues it had, the difference between Martin Luther and the church in terms of their religious differences, and then the political impact. How does all this religion impact history? So let's talk about the medieval church. It is very similar in terms of the structure that your social pyramid is and that you got somebody at the top and then the farther down you go, the more members there are. Pope, cardinals, bishops, priests, and then monks and nuns, and then even at the bottom of that, you got everybody like you and me, kind of the dumb spiritual people, the normal people in the world. But the church is organized in that hierarchical uh, style, very similar to, say, society would be at that time, too. Uh, the difference here, of course, is that members of the church technically can move up from place to place. Uh, so, hey, look, I just talked about that. You've got the structure on top in society you have the structure on top in the church now the catholic church how do you get to heaven the way it was taught 16th century catholicism uh and in some cases uh catholicism today so how do you get to, to heaven uh first of all you have faith in jesus christ as the son of god so that's the kind of the faith angle that you believe something but the church also would say that you have to do good works you have to do things well. You have to live a good life. You do good tasks, things of this nature. And you have a good heart about doing it. Those two things are important. Another part of the church that's not in this padeo uh, that's important to the Catholic faith is the idea of confession. When you do something wrong, when you break faith or do bad works or sin or something like that, something against the rules and uh, the will of God, you confess your sins to a priest. You go see that priest and say, Father, I have sinned. And the priest will give you something that you do to make up for that sin or to erase that sin and get back, for lack of better words, on the right side of God. Now, as we see in the Middle Ages, though, as we're going to read about and see, there are a lot of issues that the church has that perhaps if we judge in 2017, aren't that great. So let's talk real briefly about those issues. Uh, we have this thing called simony, which means the sale of church offices. So if you have a little money, you can buy to become a priest. Uh, think about the, the implications of then who becomes a priest or who your friends are. Think Medici uh, and, and bankers and such. Pluralism, uh, forget about that. It's not really uh, important. Absenteeism, you have a job as a priest and you're not there. And that was true for many uh, priests is that they didn't show up to work. They didn't show up to take care of the flock of the people that they had to look after. And then nepotism. You're, oh, look, it's our North Korean friend. Uh, anyway, you hire someone for a job that is of some relation to you and maybe they don't have the qualifications. Uh, say you're, you're a priest and your son becomes a priest, even though uh, he's not living a life that would be worthy of being a priest. So all of these are like bad problems, but it gets worse. Level too bad. Clerical ignorance. It, it's, I mean, you can read that. I'm sure you can. Spelling is overrated. But many priests were virtually illiterate, but they still performed the mass or the Catholic worship service in a language that they didn't understand. Uh because the people had no idea that they didn't understand it because the people don't know Latin either. So guess you've got a priest speaking at church in a language he doesn't understand uh, to the people who have no idea what they're listening to anyway. Not very productive. Uh, yeah, elephants. You also have the issue of moral decay where you have popes like Alexander the Sixth hosting, let's say, quote, parties where he inv invites people to do, quote, activities in front of a court uh, 
atmosphere and there are prizes and awards given to those who do such activities the best. I'm not going to go into more detail on that because it's disgusting. Gross. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't expect people of the church in a religious uh, setting, much less the Pope, to be uh, implicated and involved in activities like these. Also, Pope's we're all about the money and looking nice, as you see. Look at this guy, right? Uh, there was a pope who said that God has given us the papacy and the position of the pope. Let us enjoy it. So many popes saw their role as, um, I guess, enjoyer in chief or someone who was to be pleasured by their job instead of trying to help others see and find God. And then there's this, indulgences. Now, imagine, again, the idea is that if you do something wrong, then it, if you sin against God, then you have to go confess that sin. Now, what some priests would do in the Middle Ages is that, and before that, is that they would tell the person, okay, you have to do this. You have to maybe go on a spiritual journey, a pilgrimage. Maybe you have to do a certain prayer so many times. That would be called an indulgence. It would be something to kind of reset your spiritual being. Well, some priests started to say, okay, let's see. Uh, if you've got some, like, 20 bucks, you know, if you give me 20 bucks, then maybe I can, like, overlook this issue. Perhaps if that 20 bucks shows up, I can get on the phone to God and say, hey, Lord, um, you know, Jimmy's okay because he paid his 20 bucks. So they're selling indulgences, and a man named Johann Tetzel is one of the best at this. We'll look at him in class a little more. Uh, but they're selling indulgences. Why? Because the church wants to make money. It is certainly an issue and a problem that really speaks to our morality. So as the church starts to engage in these activities and perhaps they become more well-known, writers begin to say, listen, I don't know, this is, this is good. It is pretty bad. And you got a guy named Erasmus who we've talked about. It wants a prince to be an ideal figure of God. He writes the book in Praise of Folly to say that men should, men should act as Jesus did, as it says in the scriptures. So this idea of Christian humanism, which is your northern renaissance. Put my head and face like that. Okay, that's exciting. Um, he wants men to act more Christ-like. And there is a saying by Erasmus's writings, this Dutch writer, uh, that Erasmus laid the egg that this dude named Luther hatched. Erasmus gets people talking about the problems in the church and how it should be fixed. And as we're going to see, Martin Luther is going to be a guy who comes around here soon that takes advantage of that position. So hey, there he is, Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King. Big difference. Not the same person. So Martin Luther and the German Reformation is this major story for 2.1. So let's introduce some folks who will be part of this story. Uh, first of all, you've got the Pope at the time, Leo X, uh, has a nice hat. Uh, you have Johann Tetzel, as I call him, Mr. Indulgences, uh, who is a seller of those indulgences to raise funds for the church. You have Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Not much power in each individual German state. But he does have money, and he does have symbolic power. And remember, when we talk about German at this time period, we're talking about the Holy Roman Empire. We have a man named Prince Frederick the Wise, who's the Prince of Saxony. It's a German state, so he's a prince who has direct control in his territory. He'll listen to the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, but Frederick the Wise is certainly uh, a major player regionally. And inside of Saxony, there is a low and not well-known priest named Martin Luther, a German monk uh, or priest who is a university scholar. He teaches the Bible. He knows it inside and out. And through that research and through that teaching, he is able to see, you know, there's some things the church is doing that is not really great. So let me kind of set the table. Uh, the church is needing Money, more money to build cathedrals in Rome, specifically a cathedral on the spot where St. Peter was crucified back in the day. So the church needs money. Where are they going to get money? We're going to sell more indulgences. We're going to tell people if you buy this amount of money, or, the, or if, you, if you buy this indulgence, if you give us this amount of money, we will forgive your sins. 
And maybe not only your sins, but maybe your relatives who are already dead. And we can then bring them from hell up to heaven. So it's certainly a financial activity. And Martin Luther, Catholic monk, Catholic priest, uh, begins to take offense to this activity. Starts to speak out a little bit, but he first of all starts writing. And he's going to write down all the problems he has in the church in one little document. There's 95 problems in total, and it's called the 95 Theses. And he takes this document that he writes, and he basically says, okay, I've got to put this somewhere where people can read it uh, and the church can see it. And he puts it on the church door of the local church in Wittenberg in southern Germany and Saxony, although this is written in Latin. So as when Luther wrote this, he wants the church to be able to read what problems he has with them, not the normal people, right? Because normal people, they can't read Latin. No one knows that. His goal, though, is to reform the church, not to create a new one. Again, Luther's goal here is to suggest changes, take away indulgences, take away simony and all these problems, he did not want to split or create a new church. That's, you know, it's inconceivable. It wouldn't happen. Someone, though, took the 95 Theses and said, you know, this kind of looks good. That person must have been able to read Latin. They took it and translated it into German and bada bing, bada boom. Uh, okay. Uh, basically saying, all right, I'm going to copy it and put it through the printing press and bam, it's everywhere. And people start to read all over Germany. This Luther's guy is making some sense. Okay, this stuff, this stuff makes sense. You know, and he's kind of pretty smart. You know, he's a Bible teacher. He must know the Bible, kind of. You know, what's in here? Martin Luther probably knows. And guess what? I don't see indulgences in here. I don't see a moral decay in those parties. I don't see permission for that. So Luther's ideas go viral and people start talking and there he is with his funny hair and not only did luther have basically complaints but he also had his own theological ideas and quickly what those are salvation for him meant faith alone you can't act your way into heaven you can't work your way into heaven you have to believe solely that jesus christ is the son of god and that's it and his argument is your actions will come out of your faith. They're not a requirement for salvation. I also believe that all church teaching should be based on the Bible, not what the church traditions might suggest over time. Here's a big one. All people with faith are equal, meaning that there is no hierarchy. If you're up here, you are just as valued by God as if you're down here. Peasant and Pope doesn't matter. All people can have a relationship with God and not just the top. You wouldn't have to go to a priest to go to God. You could pray to God yourself and get spiritual guidance that way. And Luther is encouraging these German princes to improve the church in their area. To say, forget the Holy Roman Emperor, who's a Catholic uh, fan. Forget the Pope. Change it in your area and help people get spiritual guidance that they need because he feels the Catholic Church is not doing it. Well, as you can imagine, there are reactions. People are upset. The Pope asks Luther to, quote, shut up and stop talking. Luther won't stop talking and is soon protected by Prince Frederick the Wise. Think about it. What could a noble like or a prince, you know, call it what you want, what could a guy named Prince Frederick the Wise, what would he get out of protecting Luther? That's a question we'll answer in class, but think about that. Why would he want to protect Luther? Is it just a religious argument, or maybe is it political? In any case, the church is going to look to silence Luther. Uh, there's Prince Frederick with his nice hands. Now it looks like Hagrid. The church is going to look to silence Luther. And they're going to do so by calling him on trial. Remember the Galileo incident? Well, this is the first kind of thing, uh, or maybe a better example of it, earlier than Galileo. It's called the Diet of Worms, the trial at the city of Worms in southern Germany, where the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V summons Luther to trial to defend his beliefs and ideally recant them, meaning come back or pull back from his 
ideas to say, you know, my bad. I wasn't really believing that. I, you know, I messed up. They put Luther on trial, but guess what? Luther says, no, he does not recant his beliefs. He stands tall in what he believes. And for that, he is branded a heretic or a false teacher and an outlaw to the church, meaning that if somebody were to happen like, bah, stab him, the church would not seek to maybe question that person's eternal uh, position. You know what I'm saying? So Luther is in trouble, and he leaves Worms unprotected and alone until... By the way, that's Charles V. Let's the Piper once to get out of the garage. Guess what, Piper? You're staying. Anyway, Charles V puts him on trial, convicts him. Luther is in trouble until he is kidnapped by Frederick the Wise who protects Luther for a year in his castle while there Luther will translate the Bible into German. Let's pause to think about what this means. If you now let every individual German have the ability to read a Bible, we're going to print it, we're going to copy it, and now they can read it in their own language. How important is that for people to make their own individual decisions about what's in the Bible? It's huge. It's huge. It's a game changer. For the church, at least. Because now the church does not have an authority on individual interpretation of the Bible. It's a huge change. And because of that, groups start to pop up all over southern Germany. Practicing Luther's ideas, and they're called the Lutherans. And they're a huge, growing group that take Luther's theological ideas and say, you know what? I individually should have the ability to be in charge of my spiritual journey. You know, priests are great. They give guidance, they give support, they give knowledge. But at the end of the day, the Lutherans believed that an individual had the ability to make those decisions. Uh, think how that fits in with the Renaissance. It's very similar. Oh, that's Luther at Worms. It's very exciting. Okay, now. Here's the thing about religion. Uh, in many cases in European history, it's never just about a religion. It's also about government power. And what we see after Worms is a situation where Luther's ideas become basically um, putty in the hands of political uh, officials. So what do I mean? Well, let's start with the lowest of the low. Peasants around Germany hear Luther's ideas of equality, and they hear, you know what? That equality sounds good. Instead of having the pyramid, let's just make it flat. We don't have to pay taxes if it's flat. We don't have to work hard for the nobles. Life could be better. So peasants start revolting across Germany some three years after Worms, saying, Luther says we can be equal. <laughs> However, Luther was not very positive toward the peasants uh, and the fact that he said that the people should obey their political authorities that if a politician tells you what to do like a prince um, you you have to do that your quality comes in heaven uh, so he hates this revolt and encourages princes in very strong language to stop it to crush the murdering horde of peasants uh, but think of his hidden motive what does Luther need to be able to do what he does what do any of these people need? Galileo and Da Vinci, what do they need? They need to su the support of the people who are at the top. Thank Prince Frederick the Wise. Would it be wise then for Luther to say, oh yeah, peasants, revolt, we love it. When a noble is protecting him or when a prince is protecting him? The consequence of this action of these peasant revolts being put down is that the peasants stay primarily Catholic and exit the progression of this thing called the Reformation. I neglected to tell you, but the Reformation is the title of the unit. It means the reform of the church, the change of the church throughout time. It's the Reformation. Hopefully in your review book, though, you have that as it is. After the peasants revolt, though, around Germany, there's war for 30 years. It's ugly. It's awful. People are angry. Babies dying. It's not pretty. And Charles V's dream, something I noted in section 1.4, Charles V's dream of a Catholic Europe is dying. His dream that he wants to unite all the European states under a Catholic flag is dying because of this religious conflict in the German states. 
and he's hoping for peace, but peace on his terms. But they don't come in 1555. Luther dies in 1546. The fighting is continuing, something Luther never wanted. But in 1555, we have peace, the Peace of Augsburg. And it calms the religious fighting in the German states, in the Holy Roman Emperor. But at what cost for Catholics? The provisions of this peace treaty said that princes in Germany could choose to be either a Lutheran state or a Catholic state, meaning that this enforces the division in the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. But something we're going to see throughout this whole unit is that who is making the, the religious decisions? Is it the individual? Is it the church? Or is it the head of state? Is it the head of these secular governments? So who's going to be establishing uh, the decisions for what religion you are? It's going to be those political leaders. We've seen Ferdinand and Isabella. Guess what? We're going to continue to see political leaders making religious decisions. And as I said, it results in the permanent religious division of Germany. And you look at this map in 1555, Spain is truly Catholic, but everywhere else, you're start in Italy for that matter, but everywhere else you're starting to see division. You're starting to be seeing discussion of what church is best, which religion is best. Section 2 of this uh, unit will look at the spread of the Protestant faith. So the Reformation is the process of the change. The Protestant faith is any faith, Christian faith, that is not Catholic. Protestant. It's the key, it's the word to know with this Protestant Reformation. These protesters against the Catholic Church are looking to make major changes. So we'll see that in section 2.2. And for now, we see a Germany that is divided, broken up, all by this man named Martin Luther who just wanted to make improvements, but has triggered a huge change in European religion and politics going forward.